Hello everybody, this is Antonio Wolf. We are continuing Franz Kafka's The Trial. Uh, this is the second part of chapter 7. Uh, we might finish it today. Probably not. Uh, yeah, we probably not. We still got 20 more pages. So we're, we're reading about 10 pages every time, so... Probably not make it there. Or rather, uh, we'll read 10 pages, uh, or at least get to the point where like, there's a natural break. And then we'll do it for the next part. Uh, last time we had uh, a uh, big section summarizing the way that uh, K has come to uh, learn, or rather, not, or what K has come to learn uh, by second hand completely about the nature of the court. Uh, and in the, this uh, was interesting in that it was uh, from the point of view of the narrator. Uh, for the first time. Uh, I'm not quite sure this happens ever again in the book, but uh, yeah, it was definitely noticeable. Uh, beyond that, uh, what was it? What else did we do? Uh, the main thing was what? Uh, K, uh, yeah, K uh, complains about the lawyer, says the lawyer isn't doing anything says he sees no point, he, uh, he assumes he knows what to do, so he's thinking about the dis dismissing the lawyer, uh, he's thinking about doing the process himself, he thinks he can do a better job, he's being told on no uncertain terms this is a bad idea, he's still going to do it anyways. <laughs> uh, and every time he goes to the lawyer, uh, he doesn't seem to really care, and neither does the lawyer in, in much of it. Uh, or at least not from Kay's perspective. Uh, says the, the lawyer talks at him, but Kay doesn't really listen, apparently. He's not paying that much attention. He's uh, busy flirting with... Uh, oh God, what's her name? Uh, Lenny. Lenny? Lenny. Lenny, yeah. Yeah, Lenny. <coughs> oh. Oh, welcome, Josh. Welcome to the trial by Franz Kafka. So we're on a page sixty-eight PDF uh, first paragraph break. Uh, <clears throat> start. Let's let's get going. But when Kay had the confidence to try and do all this, the difficulty of composing the documents was too much for him. Wait, are we recording? Yes. Yes. You asked. I didn't expect you to. I didn't recording. expect you to come. <laughs> so uh, we just started. Is oh, the recording? Man. Sorry. That's no problem. Nobody cares. And if they complain, they'll get a big punch in the eye. Virtually. So, okay, uh, but when Kay had the confidence to try and do all this to difficulty composing documents was too much for Oh yeah, this is concerning the, uh, what is it called? The proposition or, I forget what, what he technically calls it. It's not an appeal. Uh, it's kind of a request, but not really. Because it's just like him trying to give some kind of like first impression to the court. At least that's what I understand from what the lawyers told him. <clears throat> and Kay's kind of pissed off that it's been a month and the lawyer hasn't finished his document and turned it in. But every time the lawyer like seems to be getting some work done on it, every time Kay comes back, he's like, oh, by the way, you know, it was a good thing last time we didn't turn it in because, you know, it would have been a bad time. But we wouldn't have known it had we done it. And so that was a good thing. And uh, Kay doesn't understand why this is the case, what the hell this means, why would it be any better or worse when uh, you turn things in, or, you know, that something has happened. Uh, I mean, as far as I can tell, the obvious uh, explanation is, well, I mean, if it's about him, and this is a giant letter of introduction about Kay and trying to make Kay look good, uh, every little thing, and it says this lawyer is in contact with people from the court, exchanging information all the time uh, every little bit just kind of 
forces him to rewrite and try to put K in the best light. So uh, I assume it's an endless job of trying to uh, rewrite that every single time. Uh, K obviously doesn't understand this, doesn't see the point in this, and he's like, well, I could do that myself. Uh, and so this is what he's trying to do, and uh, he's realizing he's, he's not finding it easy. At the beginning of this chapter, uh, it starts with uh, him in his office trying to write it and throwing ideas in his head like how you're supposed to write this and he's like maybe if I just uh, write my autobiography and recount every single thing I've done and you know and every single thing I've done you know judge it for myself whether I think that's good or bad and give an explanation or justification for why I did what I did you know maybe that's what the court wants uh, it's of course in the very passage about the court it's already been stated the court is not going to be influenced by anything uh, as far as anyone can tell, there there is no logic to the influence in the court, which is basically a tantamount to nothing you do causally influences anything in the trial, uh, at least in relationship to the court itself. <clears throat> so uh, why he thinks this will have anything that the court wants, and the court kind of makes it clear that they don't want anything from you. Uh, they told him they don't want him to talk, they don't want him to do anything in relationship to them, to just shut up. Because uh, it makes it worse for him. But he's still persistent that somehow he can say something magically and uh, the court will care. So we're continuing, or rather <laughs> beginning, <laughs> actually continuing from last time. But when Kay had the confidence to try and do all this, the difficulty of composing documents was too much for him. Earlier, just a week or so before, he could only have felt shame at the thought of being made to write about such out such documents himself and had never entered his head the task could be could also be difficult he remembered one morning when already piled up with work he suddenly shoved everything to one side and took a pad of paper in which he sketched out some of his thoughts on how documents of this sort should proceed perhaps he would offer them uh, to that slow-witted lawyer but just then the door of the manager's office opened and the deputy director entered the room with a loud laugh Kay was embarrassed although the deputy director of course was not laughing at Kay's documents which he knew nothing about, but at a joke he had just heard about the stock exchange, a joke which needed an illustration if it, if it was to be understood. And now the deputy director leant over Kay's desk, took his pencil from his hand, and drew the illustration on the writing pad that Kay had intended for his ideas about his case. Kay had no more thoughts of shame. The documents had to be prepared and submitted. If, as was very likely, he could find no time to do it in the office, he would have to do it at home at night. If the nights weren't enough, he would have to take a holiday. Above he could not stay above he could not stop halfway. That was nonsense not only in business but always and everywhere. Needless to say the documents would mean an almost endless amount of work. <coughs> Excuse me. It was easy to come to the belief, not only for those of an anxious disposition, that it was impossible ever to finish it. This was not because of laziness or deceit, which were the only things that might have hindered the lawyer in preparing it, but because he did not know what the charge was or even what consequences it might bring, so that he had to remember every tiny action and event from the whole of his life, looking at them from all sides and checking and reconsidering them. It was also a very disheartening job. It would have been more suitable as a way of passing long days after he had retired and become senile. But now, just when Kay needed to apply all his thoughts to his work, when he was still rising and already posed a threat to the deputy director, when every hour passed so quickly and he wanted to enjoy the brief evenings and nights as a young man, this was the time he had to, work, to start working out these documents. Once more, he began to feel resentment. Almost involuntarily, only to put an end to it, his finger felt for the button of the electric bell in the anteroom. As he pressed it, he glanced up to the clock. It was 11 o'clock, two hours, he had spent a great deal of his costly time just dreaming and his wits were, of course, even more dulled than they had been before. But the time had nonetheless not been wasted and he had come to some decisions that could be of value. As well as various pieces of mail, the servitors brought two visiting cards from gentlemen who had already been waiting for Kay for some time. They were actually very important clients of the bank who should not really have been kept waiting under any circumstances. Why had they come at such an awkward time, and why the gentleman on the other side of the, clo the closed door seemed to be asking, was the industrious K using up the best business time for his private affairs? Tired from what had gone before, and tired in anticipation of what was to follow, K stood up to receive the first of them. He was a short, jolly man, a manufacturer who K knew well. He apologized for disturbing K at some important work. 
and K for his part apologized for having kept the manufacturer waiting for so long. But even this apology was spoken in such a mechanical way and with such false intonation that the manufacturer would, cer would certainly have noticed if he had not been fully preoccupied with his business affairs. Instead, he hurriedly pulled calculations and tables out from all his pockets, spread them out in front of K, explained several items, corrected a little mistake in the arithmetic that he had noticed as he quickly glanced over it all, and reminded K of a similar piece of business he'd concluded with him about a year before, mentioning in passing that this time there was another big spending great effort to get this to get his business, and finally stopped speaking in order to learn Kay's opinion on the matter. And Kay had indeed at first been closely following what the manufacturer was saying. He too was aware of how important the deal was, but unfortunately it did not last. He soon stopped listening, nodded at each of the manufacturer's louder exclamations for a short while, but eventually he stopped doing even that, and did no more than stare at the bald head bent over the papers, asking himself when the manufacturer would finally realize that everything he was saying was useless. When he did stop talking, Kay really thought at first that this was so that he would have the chance to confess that he was incapable of listening. Instead, seeing the anticipation on the manufacturer's face, obviously ready to counter any objections made, he was sorry to realize that the businessman's discussion had to be continued. So he bent his head as if he'd been given an order and began slowly to move his pencil over the papers. Now and then he would stop and stare at one of the figures. The manufacturer thought there must be some objection. Perhaps his figures weren't really sound. Perhaps they weren't the decisive issue. <coughs> Whatever he thought, the manufacturer covered the papers with his hand and began once again, moving very close to Kay, to explain what the deal was all about. It is difficult, said Kay, pursing his lips. The only thing that could offer him any guidance were the papers, and the manufacturer had covered them from his view, so he just sank back against the arm of the chair. Even when the door of the manufacturer's office opened and revealed up not very clearly, as if through a veil, the deputy director, he did no more than look up weakly. Kay thought no more about the matter. He merely watched the immediate effect of the deputy director's appearance, and for him, the effect was very pleasing. The manufacturer immediately jumped up from his seat and hurried over to meet the deputy director, although Kay would have liked to make him ten times livelier, as he feared the deputy director might disappear again. They need not have worried, the two gentlemen met each other, shook each other's hands, and went together over to Kay's desk. The manufacturer said he was sorry to find the chief clerk so little inclined to do business, pointing to Kay, who under the view the deputy director had bent back down over the papers. Yeah, over the papers. As the two men leant over the desk and the manufacturer made some effort to gain and keep the deputy director's attention, Kay felt as if they were much bigger than they really were, and that their negotiations were about him. Carefully and slowly turning his eyes upwards, he tried to learn what was taking place above him, took one of the papers from his desk without looking to see what it was, lay it on the flat of his hand, and raised it slowly up as he rose to the level of the two men himself. He had no particular plan in mind as he did this, but merely felt this was how he would act if only he had finished preparing that great document that was to remove his burden, that was to remove his burden entirely. The deputy director had been paying all his attention to the conversation and did no more than glance at the paper. He did not read what was written on it at all, as what was important for the chief clerk was not important for him. He took it from Kay's hand, saying, Thank you, I'm familiar. I'm already familiar with everything, and lay calmly back on the desk. Kay gave him a bitter, sideways look. But the deputy director did not notice this at all, and if he did notice it, it was only it only raised his spirits. He frequently laughed out loud one time he clearly embarrassed the manufacturer when he raised an objection in a witty way, but drew him immediately back out of his embarrassment by commenting adversely on himself, and finally invited him into his office where they could bring the matter to its conclusion. <clears throat> it's a very important matter, said the manufacturer. I understand that completely, and I'm sure the chief clerk, even as he said this, he was actually speaking only to the manufacturer, will be very glad to have us to have us take it off his hands. This is something that needs calm consideration. But he seems to be overburdened today. There are even some people in the room outside who've been waiting there for hours for him. Kay still had enough control of himself to turn away from the deputy director and direct his friendly, albeit stiff, smile only at the manufacturer. He made no other retaliation, bent down slightly and supported himself with both hands on his desk like a clerk, and watched the two gentlemen still talking, took the papers from his desk, and disappeared into the manager's office. In the doorway, the manufacturer turned and said he wouldn't make his farewell with Kay just yet. He would, of course, let Chief Clerk know about the success of his discussions, but he also had little, he had a little something to tell him about.
At last, Kay was by himself. It did not enter his head to show anyone else into his office, and only became vaguely aware of how nice it was that the people outside thought he was still negotiating with the manufacturer, and for this reason he could not let anyone in to see him, not even the servitor. He went over to the window, sat down on the ledge beside it, held firmly onto the handle, and looked down onto the square outside. The snow was still falling, the weather still had not brightened up at all. He remained a long time sitting in this way, not knowing what it actually was that made him so anxious. Only occasionally did he glance, slightly startled, over his shoulder at the door to the outer room where, mistakenly, he thought he'd hear some noise. No one came and made him feel calm, and that made him feel calm. Eh. And that made him feel calmer. He went over to the washstand, rinsed his face with cold water, and his head somewhat clearer, went back to his place by the window. The decision to take his defense into his own hands now seemed more of a burden than he had originally assumed. All the while he had left his defense up to his lawyer, his trial had had little basic effect on him. He had observed it from afar as something that was scarcely able to reach him directly. When it suited him, he looked to see how things stood, but he was also able to draw his head back again whenever he wanted. Now, in contrast, if he was to conduct his defense himself, he would have to devote himself entirely to the court, for the time being at least. Success would mean, later on, his complete and conclusive liberation. But if he was to achieve this, he would have to place himself, to start with, in far greater danger than he had been in so far. If he ever felt tempted to doubt this, then his experience with the deputy director and the manufacturer that day would be quite enough to convince him of it. How could he have sat there totally convinced of the need to do his own defense? How would it be later? What would his life be like in the days ahead? Would he find the way through it all to a happy conclusion? Did a carefully worked out defense and any other sort would have made no sense? Did a carefully worked out defense not also mean he would need to shut himself off from everything else as much as he could? Would he survive that? And how was he to succeed in conducting all this at the bank? It involved much more than just submitting some documents that he could probably prepare in a few days' leave, although it would have been great to sorry. Although it would have been great to Merity to ask for a time off from the bank just at the time. It was a whole trial, and there was no way of seeing how long it might last. This was an enormous difficulty that had suddenly been thrown into Kay's life. And was he supposed to be doing the bank's work at a time like this? He looked down at his desk. Was he supposed to let people in to see him and go into negotiations with them at a time like this? While his trial trundled on, while the court officials upstairs in the attic room sat looking at the papers for this trial, should he be worrying about the business of the bank? Did this not seem like a kind of torture acknowledged by the court, connected with the trial in which followed him around? And is it likely that anyone in the bank, when judging his work, would take any account of his peculiar situation? No one, and never. There were those who knew about his trial, although it was, not, it was not quite clear who knew about it or how much. But he hoped rumors had not reached as far as the deputy director, otherwise he would obviously soon find a way of making use of it to harm Kay. He would show neither comradeship nor humaneness. And what about the director? It was true that he was well disposed towards Kay, and as soon as he heard about the trial he would probably try to do everything he could to make it easier for him, but he would certainly not devote himself to it. Kay at one time had provided the counterbalance to what the deputy director said, but the director was now coming more and more under his influence, and the deputy director would also exploit the weakened condition of the director to strengthen his own power. So what could Kay hope for? Maybe considerations of this sort weakened his power of resistance, but it was still necessary not to deceive oneself and to see everything as clearly as it could be seen at that moment. For no particular reason, just to just to avoid returning to his desk for a while, he opened the window. It was difficult to open and he had to turn the handle with both his hands. Then, uh, the, through the whole height and breadth of the window, the mixture of fog and smoke was drawn into the room, filling it with a slight smell of burning. A few flames of snow, uh, sorry, a few flakes of snow were blown in with it. It's a horrible autumn said the manufacturer, who had come into the room unnoticed after seeing the deputy director, and now stood behind Kay. Kay nodded and looked uneasily at the manufacturer's briefcase. 
from which he would now probably take the papers and inform K of the result of his negotiations with the deputy director. Just a quick comment there. Uh, I don't know, the, the symbolism is pretty obvious to me, but uh, just in case people don't see it, <laughs> it's a state of his mind. Yeah, it's foggy that side. He, he lets the fog in. He he can't think anymore. Mental fog. Uh, and uh, the fact that it's uh, a noticeable slight smell of burning. Could be fog or could be smoke. Probably both. <laughs> well, smoke is fog. It's just kind of gives you cancer. <laughs> yeah. K nodded and looked uneasily at the manufacturer's briefcase, from which he would now probably take the papers and inform K of the result of his negotiations with the deputy director. However, the manufacturer saw where K was looking, knocked on his briefcase, and without opening it said, You'll be wanting to hear how things turned out? I've already got the contract in my pocket almost. He's a charming man, your deputy director. He's got his dangers though. He laughed as he looked as he shook yeah. He laughed as he shook Kay's hand and wanted to make him laugh with him. But to Kay, it once more seemed suspicious that the manufacturer did not want to show him the papers and saw nothing about his comments to laugh at. Chief Clerk, said the manufacturer, I expect the weather's been affecting your mood, has it? You're looking so worried today. Yes, said Kay, raising his hand and holding the temple of his head. Headaches, worries in the family. Quite right, said the manufacturer, who was always in a hurry and could never listen to anyone for very long. Everyone has his cross to bear. Kay had unconsciously made a step towards the door as if wanting to show the manufacturer out, but the manufacturer said, yeah, Chief Clerk, there's something else I'd like to mention to you. I'm very sorry if it's something that'll be a burden to you today of all days, but I've been to see you. Oh, okay, sorry. Well, let me read that. I'm very sorry if it's something that'll be a burden. That will be a burden to you today, as of all days, but I've been to see you twice already, lately, and each time I forgot all about it. If I delayed any longer, it might well lose its point altogether. That would be a pity, as I think what I've got to say does have some value. Before Kay had the time to answer, the manufacturer came up close to him, tapped his knuckle lightly on his chest, and said quietly, You've got a trial going on, haven't you? Kay stepped back and immediately exclaimed, that's what the deputy director has been telling you. No, no, said the manufacturer. How would the deputy director know of things about the court here and there, said the manufacturer. And that even applies to what it is that I wanted to tell you about. There are so many people who have connections with the court, said Kay with a lowered head. And he led the manufacturer over to his desk. They sat down there where they had been before and the manufacturer said it. I'm afraid it's not very much that I've got to tell you about. Only in matters like this, it's best not to overlook the tiniest details. Besides, I really want to help you in some way, however modest my help might be. We've been good business partners up till now, haven't we? Well then. Kay wanted to apologize for his behavior in the conversation earlier that day, but the manufacturer would tolerate no interruption, shoved his briefcase up high in his armpit to show that he was in a hurry, and carried on. I know about your case through a certain Titarelli. He's a painter. Titarelli is just his artistic name. I don't even know what his real name is. He's been coming to me in my office for years from time to time and brings little pictures with him which I buy more or less just for the sake of charity as he's hardly more than a beggar. And they're nice pictures too. More land, landscapes and that sort of thing. We've both got used to doing business in this way and it always went smoothly. Only one time these visits became a bit too frequent. I began to tell him off for it we started talking and I became interested how it was that he could earn a living just by painting. And then I learned to my amazement that his main source of income was painting portraits. I work for the courts, he said. What court? said I. And that's when he told me about the court. I'm sure you can imagine how amazed I was at being told all this. Ever since then I learned something new about the court every time he comes to visit and so little by little I get to understand something of how it works. Anyway. Tidarelli talks a lot and I often have to push him away, not only because he's bound to be lying, but also, most of all, because a businessman like me who's already close to breaking point under the weight of his own business worries can't pay too much attention to other people's. 
But all that's just by the by. Perhaps, <coughs> excuse me, perhaps, this is what I've been thinking, perhaps Tiddly might be able to help you in some small way. He knew lots of judges, and even if he can't have much influence himself, he can give you some advice about how to get some influential people on your side. And even if this advice doesn't turn out to make all the difference, I still think it'll be very important once you've got it. You're nearly a lawyer yourself. That's what I always say, Mr. K. The chief clerk is nearly a lawyer. Oh, I'm sure this trial of yours will turn out all right. So, do you want to go and see Tirelli then? If I ask him to, he'll certainly do everything he possibly can. I really do think you ought to go. It need be today, of course, just some time when you get the chance. And anyway, I want to tell you this too. You don't actually have to go and see Tirelli. This advice from me doesn't place you under any obligation at all. No, if you think you can get by without Tidarelli, it'll certainly be better to leave him completely out of it. Maybe you've already got a clear idea of what you're doing, and Tidarelli could upset your plans. Now, if that's the case, then of course you shouldn't go there under any circumstances. And it certainly won't be easy to take adva advantage from a lad like that. That's right. And it certainly won't be easy to take advice from a lad like that. Still, it's up to you. Here's a letter of recommendation, and here's the address. So this is the third time I think we've seen mentioned that uh, for certain kinds of aid, if you don't know anything, well, you might as well try something. But that if somehow you already have something going on and you're certain of it, uh, it's not good to even bother going and, and, and trying uh, these other avenues, uh, even tangentially. Uh, it'll harm in your case. Uh, just something to keep in mind. Uh, I have some thoughts about why that is, but I'm not entirely sure. Alright, continuing. Disappointed, Kate took the letter and put it in his pocket. Even at best, the advantage he might derive from this recommendation was incomparably smaller than the damage that lay in the fact of the manufacturer knowing about his trial, and that the painter was spreading the news about. It was all he could manage to give the manufacturer who was already on his way to the door a few words of thanks. I'll go there, he said as he took his leave of the manufacturer at the door, or as I'm very busy at present. I'll write to him. Perhaps he would like to come to me in my office some time. I was sure you'd find the best solution, said the manufacturer. Although I had thought to prefer to avoid inviting people like this Tetarelli to the bank and talking about the trial here. And it's not always a good idea to send letters to people like Tetarelli. You don't know what might happen to them. But you're bound to have thought everything through and you know what you can do, what you can and you can't do. Kay nodded and accompanied the manufacturer on through the anteroom. But despite seeming calm on the outside, he was actually very shocked. He had told the manufacturer he would write to Tittarelli only to show, him on some, to show him in some way that he valued his recommendations and would consider the opportunity to speak with Tittarelli without delay. But if he had thought Tittarelli could offer any worthwhile assistance, he would not have delayed. But it was only the manufacturer's comment that made Kay realize what dangers that could lead to. Was he really able to rely on his own understanding so little? If it was possible that he might invite a questionable character to the bank with a clear letter and ask advice from him about his trial, separated from the deputy director by no more than a door, was it not possible or even very likely that there were also other dangers he had failed to see or that he was even running towards? There was not always someone beside him to warn him, and just now, just when he would have to act with all the strength he could muster, now a number of doubts of the sort he had never before known had presented themselves and affected his own vigilance. The difficulties he had been feeling in carrying out his office work, were they now going to affect the trial too? Now at least he found himself quite unable to understand how he could have intended to write to Titarelli and invite him to the bank. So, uh, some serious mental fog there. <coughs> Although, uh, this, this sentence, uh, the difficulties he had been feeling in carrying out his office work, were they now going to affect the trial too? Uh, I mean, just earlier in this, it was the reverse. You know, he's noticing that the trial is affecting his work, and then here, uh, 
I think this is him being muddle-headed that uh, he he gives his the he blames his work or rather he uses his work to explain his muddle-headedness about the trial not the trial to explain his muddle-headedness about his work because <laughs> he's hardly working He shook his head at the thought of it once more as the servitor came up beside him and drew his attention to the three gentlemen who were waiting on a bench in the anteroom. They had already been waiting to see Kay for a long time. Now that the servitor was speaking with Kay, they had stood up and each of them wanted to make use of the opportunity to see Kay before the others. He had been negligent to the bank to let them waste their time before in the waiting room, but none of them wanted to draw attention to this. Mr. Kay, one of them was saying. But Kay had told the servitor to fetch his winter coat and said to the three of them as the servitor helped them to put it on, Please forgive me, gentlemen. I'm afraid I have no time to see you at present. Please do forgive me, but I have some urgent business to settle and have to leave straight away. You've already seen yourselves how long I've been delayed. Would you be so kind as to come back tomorrow or sometime? Or perhaps you could settle your affairs by telephone. Or perhaps you would like to tell me now briefly what it's about and I can then give you a full answer in writing. Whatever the best thing will be for you to come here again. No, sorry, I read that weirdly. But whatever, the best thing will be for you to come here again. The gentlemen now saw that their wait had been totally pointless, and these suggestions of Kay's left them so astounded that they looked at each other without a word. That's agreed then, is it? asked Kay, who had turned toward the servitor, bringing him his hat. Through the open door of Kay's office, they could see that the snowfall outside had become much heavier. So Kay turned the collar of his coat and... Uh, sorry. So Kay turned the collar of his coat up and buttoned it up high under his chin. Just then, the deputy director came out of the adjoining room, smiled as he saw Kay negotiating with the gentleman in his winter coat, and asked, Are you about to go out? Yes, said Kay, standing more upright. I have to go out on some business. But the deputy director had already turned towards the gentleman. And what about these gentlemen? he asked. I think they've already been waiting quite a long time. We've already come to an understanding, said Kay, but now the gentlemen could be held back no longer. They surrounded Kay and explained that they would not have been waiting for hours if it had not been about something important that had to be discussed now, at length and in private. The deputy director listened to them for a short while. He also looked at Kay as he held his hat in his hand, cleaning the dust off it here and there, and then he said, Gentlemen, there is a very simple way to solve this. If you would prefer it, I'll be very glad to take over these negotiations instead of the chief clerk. Your business does, of course, need to be discussed without delay. We are businessmen like yourselves and know the value of a good businessman's time. Would you like to come this way? And he opened the door leading to the anteroom of his own office. The deputy director seemed very good at appropriating everything that Kay was now forced to give up. But was Kay not giving up more than he absolutely had to? By running off to some unknown painter with, as he had to admit, very little hope of any vague benefit, his renown was suffering damage that could, be, that could not be repaired. It would probably be much better to take off his winter coat again, and at the very least, try to win back the two gentlemen who were certainly still waiting in the next room. If Kay had not then glimpsed the deputy director in his office, looking for something from his bookshelves as if they were his own, he would probably even have made the attempt. As Kay, somewhat agitated, approached the door, the deputy director called, Oh, you still not left. He turned his face toward him. Its many deep folds seemed to show strength rather than age, and immediately began once more to search. I'm looking for a copy of a contract, he said, which this gentleman insists you must have. Could you help me look for it, do you think? Kay made a step forward, but the deputy director said, Thank you, I've already found it. And with a big package of papers, which certainly must have included many more documents than just a copy of the contract, he turned and went back into his office. I can't deal with him right now, Kay said to himself. But once my personal difficulties have been settled, then he'll certainly be the first to get the effect of it, and he certainly won't like it. Slightly calmed by these thoughts, Kay gave the servitor, who had already been holding the door to the corridor open for him, the task of telling the director, when he was able, that Kay was going out of the bank on a business matter. As he left the bank, he felt most almost happy at the thought of being able to devote more of himself to his own business for a while. So, uh, yet another instance, uh, or a couple of instances of Kay being selfish, not thinking about other people, 
and uh, not paying attention to when people are genuinely helping him. Uh, you know, the businessman comes along, gives him a tip, and all that Kay initially thinks of is, uh, wow, this bastard knows about my trial, fuck. That's terrible. And he's like, this information he's giving me is useless. You know, he was telling him that he would mail the guy uh, because he just wanted him to go away and he was not going to even bother looking into this help at all. Uh, and then out of uh, noticing that what he said, not that he was even going to do it, but just what he said was stupid, uh, he starts doubting his own judgment and then decides to uh, trust in the judgment of somebody who he doesn't even trust, supposedly. So, <laughs> bizarre. Uh, uh, there's some contentious judgment of the businessman uh, on Kay's part. Um, then the deputy director, uh, well, all he does is like, uh, everyone can notice that Kay is out of it. Uh, and instead of like uh, berating him or, you know, pulling him in, in, into his office along with the uh, president of the bank uh, and saying, like, what's up, man? What's going on? Uh, they all just kind of let him do his thing and just take the load of work off his hands. Which, I mean, it is a pretty nice thing to do. <coughs> and Kay's just going like, oh, this guy's stealing my my work. And he's like, if only I, you know, I was I had better things. Uh, I wasn't dealing with this trial, you know, I'd show him. He's not looking at it as help. He's looking at it as like that the help is actually damaged towards him. It's uh, nothing new in Kay's character. <coughs> Uh, and then the third thing is uh, he's going to go see this painter whom he al he doesn't know who he is uh, and he's already judging him as useless to his cause a waste of his time uh, and nonetheless the fact that he judges this he's still going to go see him uh, contradictory stuff I don't know uh, so far uh, pretty straightforward uh, uh, anyone got any thoughts or comments along with it? No. Mm -hmm. Yep, pretty straightforward. He went straight to the painter who lived in an outlying part of town which was very near to the court offices. Although this area was even poorer, the houses were darker, the streets were full of dirt, as slowly flew about over the half-melted snow. In the great gateway to the building, where the painter lived, only one of the two doors was open. A hole had been broken open in the wall by the other door, and as Kay approached it, a repulsive yellow steaming liquid shot out, causing some rats to curry, scurry away into the nearby canal. I assume that somebody pe somebody's uh, pee bucket. Because <laughs> uh, they probably don't have toilets uh, and plumbing of that sort anyways. So down by the staircase there was a small child lying on its belly crying, but it could hardly be heard because of the noise from the metal work shop on the other side of the entrance hall, drowning out any other sound. The door to the workshop was open and three workers stood in a circle around some piece of work that they were beating with hammers. A large tin plate hung on the wall, casting a pale light that pushed its way into way in between two of the workers, lighting up their faces and their work aprons. Kay did no more than than glance at any of these things. He wanted to get things over with here as soon as possible to exchange just a few words to find out how things stood with the painter and go straight back to the bank. I gotta say this is odd. Uh, a metal workshop right next to apartments, or in apartments. I mean, it's by the staircase. Uh, seems kind of really, really weird. small child crying at the 
by the staircase on their belly um, who knows a large thing uh, okay that's what I need to do uh, even if he had some tiny success here it would still have a good effect on his work at the bank for that day on the third floor he had to slow down his pace he was quite out of breath the steps just like the height of each floor were much higher than they needed to be and he'd be told that the painter lived right up in the attic the air was also quite oppressive there was no proper stairwell and the narrow steps were closed in by walls on both sides with no more than a small high window here and there just as Kay paused for a while, some young girls ran out of one of the flats and rushed higher up the stairs, laughing. Kay followed him slowly, caught up with one of the girls who had stumbled in between and been left behind by the others and asked her as they went up side by side, Is there a painter, Titorelli, who lives here? The girl, the girl, hardly 13 years old and somewhat hunchbacked, jabbed him with her elbow and looked at him sideways. Her youth and her bodily defects had done nothing to stop her being already quite depraved. She did not smile once, but looked at Kay earnestly, with sharp, acquisitive eyes. Kay pretended not to notice her behavior and asked, Do you know Titarelli the painter? She nodded and asked in reply. What do you want to see him for? Kay thought it would be to his advantage quickly to find out something more about Titarelli. I want to have him paint my portrait, he said. Paint your portrait, she asked, opening her mouth too wide and, slight and lightly hitting Kay with her hand, as if he had said something extraordinarily surpri surprising or clumsy. With both hands, she lifted her skirt, which was already very short, and as fast as she could, she ran off after the other girls, whose indistinct shouts lost themselves in the heights. So, uh... Yet another uh, symbolic female, but uh, unlike the other ones, which were uh, appealing to Kay, uh, this one is not. Not only is she not uh, a woman fully developed and sexually attracted to him, but uh, you know, particularly uh, she's got deformities and uh, she's actually mean to him. <laughs> uh, we'll find out why. Uh, another thing to point out is uh, as he climbed the stairs, uh, he's uh, finding it hard to breathe, short on breath, uh, yet another uh, form of symbolism that he's uh, entering the higher domain of uh, the courts here. Uh, just like when he went to the, uh, the court offices. Uh, at the next turn of the stairs, however, Kay encountered all the girls once more. The hunchback girl had clearly told them about Kay's intention. They were waiting for him. They stood on both sides of the stairs, pressing themselves against the wall so that Kay could get through between them and smooth their aprons down with their hands. All their faces, even in this guard of honor, showed a mixture of childishness and depravity. Up at the head of the line of girls, who now laughing began to close in around Kay, was the hunchback who had taken on the role of leader. It was thanks to her that Kay found the right direction without delay. He would have continued up the stairs straight in front of him, but she showed him that to reach Titarelli he would need to turn off to one side. The steps that led to the painter were especially narrow, very long without any turning. The whole length could be seen in one glance, and at the top, at Titarelli's closed door, it came to its end. The door was much more illuminated than the rest of the stairway, but the light from a small skylight set obliquely above it, it had been put together one painted planks of wood and the name Titarelli was painted on it in broad red brush strokes. Kay was no more than halfway up the steps accompanied by his retinue of girls when clearly the result of the noise of all those footsteps the door opened slightly and in the crack a man who seemed to be dressed in just his nightshirt, ap nightshirt appeared. Oh! he cried and when he saw the approaching crowd uh, when he saw the approaching crowd and vanished. The hunchbacked girl clapped her hands in glee and the other girls crowded in behind Kay to push him faster forward. They still had not arrived at the top, however, when the painter up above them suddenly pulled the door wide open and with a deep bow invited Kay to enter. The girls on the other hand, he tried to keep away. He did not want to let any of them in however much they begged him and however much they tried to get in. If they could not get in with his permission, they would try to force their way in against his will. And only one to 
the, the only one to succeed was the hunchback when she slipped through under his outstretched arm. But the painter chased after her, grabbed her by the skirt, span her round, <coughs> span her once around, and set her down again by the door with the other girls who, unlike the first, had not dared to cross the doorstep with the, while the painter had lost that, while the painter had left his post. Kay did not know what he was to make of all of this, as they all seemed to be having fun. One behind the other, the girls by the door stretched their necks up high and called out various words to the painter which were meant in jest but which Kay did not understand, and even the painter laughed as the hunchback whirled around in his hand. Then he shut the door, bowed once more to Kay, offered him his hand, and introduced himself, saying, Tintorelli, painter. Kay pointed to the door behind which the girls whispered and said, You seem to be very popular in this building. Ah, those brats said the painter, trying in vain to fasten his nightshirt at the neck. He was also barefooted, and apart from that, was wearing nothing more than a loose pair of yellowish linen trousers held up with a belt whose free end whipped to and fro. Those kids are a real burden to me, he continued. The top button of his nightshirt came off, and he gave up trying to fasten it, fetched the chair for Kay, and made him sit down on it. I painted one of them once, she's not here today, and ever since they've been following me about if I'm here... They're, eh. If I'm here, they only come in when I allow it, but as soon as I've gone, there's always at least one of them in here. They've had a key made to my door and lend it round to each other. It's hard to imagine what a pain that is. Suppose I come back home with a lady I'm going to paint. I open the door with my own key and find the hunchback there or something. By the table, painting her lips red with my paintbrush, and meanwhile her little sisters will be keeping guard for her, moving about and causing chaos in every corner of the room. Or else, like happened yesterday, I might come back home late in the evening. Please forgive my, please forgive my appearance in the room being a mess. It is to do with them. So I might come home late in the evening and want to go to bed. Then I feel something pinching my leg. I look under the bed and pull another of them out from under it. I don't know why it is they bother me like this. I expect you've just seen that I do nothing to encourage them to come near me, as they make it hard for me to do my work. Of course, if I didn't get the studio for nothing, I'd have moved out a long time ago. Just then, a little voice, tender and anxious, called out from the door. Titarelli, can we come in now? No, answered the painter. Not even just me, by myself? The voice asked again. Not even just you, said the painter, as he went to the door and locked it. <coughs> so if you remember, the uh, businessman uh, said Titarelli was a liar. That... Uh, he was always uh, lying, and uh, given that he's a painter, that's a perfect uh, conceptualization, or rather characterization of a concept. Beauty is deceiving. Uh, painters deal in the realm of painting the beautiful in some way, some sort. Uh, so the fact that uh, he's a liar is not surprising. Now, considering what he says about the girls, he's clearly lying. He likes them, just as they like him. <laughs> so if K uh, just takes him at his word, K's an idiot. Now, as far as the children... I'm not entirely sure. Well, the first thing that comes to mind right now is that he ha that a painter who deals with the concept of beauty has a relationship, a good relationship with children, seems to me like a pretty strong connection. Uh, that seems to be a pretty solid one. Uh, children are very aesthetically inclined. Now the part, the part of the hunchback, I'm still not entirely sure of, and the part about them being mean to him, I'm I'm still not entirely sure of. Uh, any ideas up here, Josh? Yeah, I don't know. I'll have to think about it. Now. I'll keep that in mind. So 
So, okay. Meanwhile, Kay had been looking around the room. If it had not been pointed out, it would never have occurred to him that this wretched little room could be called a studio. It was hardly long enough or broad enough to make two steps. Everything, floor, walls, and ceiling was made of wood. Between the planks, narrow gaps could be seen. Across from where Kay was, the bed stood against a wall under a covering of many different colors. In the middle of the room, a picture stood on an easel, covered over with a shirt whose arms dangled down to the ground. Behind Kay was a window through which the fog made it impossible to see further than the snow-covered roof of the neighboring building. So this is a pretty good connection. Uh, beauty being something that is a surface show uh, is kind of a lot of a fog. It uh, hides things. Uh, and I will see that this concept uh, connects even more strongly, or rather is developed even more strongly uh, in what Titarelli has to say to Kay. The turning of the key in the lock reminded Kay that he had not wanted to stay too long, so he drew the manufacturer's letter out from his pocket, held it out to the painter, and said, I learned about you from this gentleman, an acquaintance of yours, and it's on his advice that I've come here. The painter glanced at the letter and threw it down onto the bed. If the manufacturer had not said very clearly what that Tirelli was an acquaintance of his, a poor man who was dependent on his charity, then it would really have been quite possible for him, possible to believe that Tirelli did not know him, or at least that he could not remember him. This impression was augmented by the painter's asking, Were you wanting to buy some pictures, or did you want to have yourself painted? Kay looked at the painter in astonishment. What did the letter actually say? Kay had taken it as a matter of course that the manufacturer had explained to the painter in his letter that Kay wanted, that Kay wanted nothing more with him than to find out more about his trial. He had been far too rash in coming here, but now he had to give the painter some sort of answer, and glancing at the easel said, are you working on a picture currently? Yes, said the painter, and he took the short hanging over the easel and threw it to the bed, onto the bed after the letter. I'm just going to say another thing. This was clearly a test. Yet again, he's failed. <coughs> uh, one, he acknowledges he was stupid. He didn't look at the, what the letter actually said. You know, he could have just like put in another envelope afterwards. Uh, Two, he doesn't know this guy. He already knows this guy is coming to the court. He already knows this guy knows about his trial. And he's being stubborn and just not being out with it. So now he's like trying to find some roundabout way to not do what he came here to do, which was he just wanted to find out more about his trial, which he knows this guy knows. Uh, K being stupid, uh, yet again. So, are you working on a picture currently? Yes, said the, the painter. And he took the shirt hanging over the easel and threw it onto the bed after the letter. It's a portrait. Quite a good piece of work, although it's not quite finished yet. This was a convenient coincidence for Kay. It gave him a good opportunity to talk about the court as the picture showed very clearly a judge. What's more, it was remarkably similar to the picture in the lawyer's office, although this one showed a quite different judge, a heavy man with a full beard which was black and bushy and extended to the sides far up the man's cheeks. Lowry's picture was also an oil, an oil painting, whereas this one had been made with pastel colors and was pale and unclear. But everything else about the picture was similar, as this judge too was holding tightly to the arm of his throne and seemed ominously about to rise from it. At first, Kay was about to say, He certainly is a judge, but he held himself back for the time being and went closer to the picture as if he wanted to study it in detail. There was a large figure thrown in the middle of the throne's backrest, which Kay could not understand and asked the painter about it. Then I'll need some more work done on it, the painter told him, and taking a pastel crayon from a small table, he added a few strokes to the edges of the figure without, but without making it any clearer as far as Kay could make out. That's the figure of justice, said the painter, finally. Now I see, said Kay. Here's the blindfold and here are the scales. But aren't those wings on her heels, and isn't she moving? Yes, said the painter. I had to paint it like that according to the contract. It's actually the figure of justice and the goddess of victory all in one. That's not a good combination, said Kay with a smile. Justice needs to remain still, otherwise the scales will move about and it won't be possible to make a just verdict. 
I'm just doing what the client wanted, said the painter. Yes, certainly, said Kay, who had not meant to criticize anyone by that comment. You've painted that figure as it actually appears on the throne. No, said the painter. I'd never seen that figure or that throne. It's all just invention, but they told me what it was I had to paint. How's that? asked Kay, pretending not fully to understand what the painter said. That is a judge sitting on a judge's chair, isn't it? Yes, said the painter. But that judge isn't very high up, but he's never sat on any throne like that. And he has himself painted in such a grand pose? He's sitting there just like the president of the court. Yeah, gentlemen like this are very vain, said the painter. But they have permission from higher up to get themselves painted like this. It's laid down quite strictly just what sort of portrait each of them can get for himself. Only it's a pity that you can't make out the details of his costume and pose in his picture. Pastel colors aren't really suitable for showing people like this. Yes, said Kay. It does seem odd that it's in pastel colors. That's what the judge wanted, said the painter. It's meant to be for a woman. <laughs> well, I don't know, that's pretty obvious to me. Uh, than why it's made in pastels. Uh, initially my thinking was, well it's painted in pastels because it's probably depicting uh, a judge uh, who's not yet fully determinate. Uh, the one in the lawyer's office uh, is already a judge that's established. You know, a judgment uh, of has already been made. Uh, it's clear, where the, or rather the movement of the judgment is already clear. And in this, if we take the liberty of assuming this has to do with K, because I mean, why, why wouldn't we assume this? Uh, this would have to do with K's trial. Uh, K's trial is uh, still not yet fully determined. Uh, for those who are aware, for whom you know, you point out just a small little detail, uh, suddenly the picture jumps into clarity and Kay, you know, just as when he pointed out, oh, that's justice and, li and uh, victory combined. And then Kay's like, oh, now I see it. Uh, but for those who don't know, like Kay, it's not clear at all. You know, it's one of those things uh, <coughs> where uh, until uh, a determining factor has been given to you, the fact, despite the thing that is already determinate, if you don't know what makes it determinate, you can't tell what it is. It's uh, famous to, uh, you know, that famous uh, phrase from McKenna where he says when he went to the Amazon, initially all he saw was just an indeterminate green. And as he got to know more about it, he could then, from the distance, see all the different shades of green and types of green uh, and types of trees and plants. Uh, same thing. Uh, the thing about being related to a woman is, uh, well, beauty is uh, sleazy and obfuscating and not completely clean and understandable, which is why when we're reading something like this, uh, the art of interpretation <laughs> requires a certain kind of skill. It's not, it's not actually obvious. And if it was obvious, this would be a piece of shit work. Uh, obvious art is not good art. There's a, a fine line between making it determinate enough so that once you know the key, you can tell how everything relates. But before that, it just kind of appears as like, I don't know what. So as uh, I think I already mentioned in the, uh, in the uh, third chapter of reading, uh, that there's a, an obviously strong connection in the story between women, uh, beauty, and... Uh, appearance and deception. And in this case, uh, indeterminacy. You know, that it's not obvious what it is. Mm. Now, the thing about the judges and the way they're painted, uh, Len Lenny and Titarelli have now both stated that the judges are vain. I'm not convinced of that. Uh, as far as I can tell, 
the few interactions with judges that we've seen have been them being very good uh, towards K uh, and as far as we've seen with other uh, interactions with the people of the court uh, they've been nice people uh, and they don't they don't seem to carry themselves in any way at least as far as K has seen that or that we've been shown that shows that they're very elitist in any way I mean the closest you can get is the student judge who uh, was elitist only in the sense of uh, telling Kay to stop being stupid and that he disagreed with the uh, examining judge about uh, what they should have done regarding his arrest uh, beyond that we haven't had any interactions which show that these people are vain in any way that uh, they're higher than thou in any way uh, so the fact that they're painted in a grandiose way here uh, it is in appearance but uh, here's I'm going to interject uh, something that uh, comes from my, my Hegelian background beauty is not necessarily a liar uh, in relationship to the immediacy of the world yes but in relationship to itself uh, to which these paintings I think they're just they're pure works of art like he says he's never seen this judge he's never seen that throne he paints this purely out of imagination uh, and something out of imagination you know you'd say oh something purely out of imagination is definitely the most fictitious thing of all in Hegelianism in the Hegelian theory of beauty nothing could be further from the truth it's completely the opposite the most true art is the one that comes from pure imagination uh, because that one would be the one that uh, comes from pure inspiration and has a pure self relationship that has no symbolic referent to anything in the real world where you would make the mistake of a wrongful association external to the work itself uh, you know so in this case uh, you couldn't interpret this art this painting of the judge according to some kind of biography of the judge because the judge doesn't even look anything like this apparently <laughs> just like the one in the lawyer's room you know when uh, he asked Lenny and Lenny says oh uh, that's from when he was from the judge when the judge was younger and the judge didn't even look like that so you know these these aren't even uh, derivable or connectable in an autobiographical sense or a biographical sense of any kind or a narrative sense which is a crown knowledgeable telling of an actual event or anything uh, they're purely symbolic uh, purely representational purely conceptual that's what I would take it so my interpretation of the image of the judges uh, and th this is interesting that all that the pictures so far have been described as it's not before the judgment it's not after the judgment but it's in the moment of the movement of the judgment itself the judge is rising up as if to say something proclaim something give judgment uh, one of those things and behind him is justice and uh, victory combined victory having the wings on her feet uh, and justice having the scales and so justice itself is moving uh, and Kay thinks he's clever in pointing out that this is a contradiction and the artist uh, being a typical artist doesn't understand the meaning of his work <laughs> you know if you want uh, this kind of uh, it's not a, an indictment of, of him at all uh, that's kind of what it is to be an artist you, you don't fully understand what you're doing uh, it's kind of impossible for the artist to understand exactly fully what they're doing uh, in a way it's uh, because uh, artworks are infinite objects uh, they have infinite determinability there's so many ways you could interpret them um, and those many ways are valid but some ways are more true than others uh, that's what I got to say to that so you know uh, this goes along with the idea of the death of the author in which like uh, even if Titarelli had some kind of interpretation which uh, 
he uh, was disposed to take up his own works, uh, it wouldn't mean jack shit about what the work actually means. So anyways, uh, the thing about vainness, uh, I don't buy it. Uh, the thing, and also it's mentioned that the, the judges have permission from the higher courts to portray themselves this way. Uh, it's not being said exactly what the higher courts are, it actually will never be said what they are. Uh, the obvious implication as far as I'm concerned is completely theological. The higher courts is you know, the, the spiritual domain of the law, the pure law itself. You know, the higher courts would be the saints, people like Moses, people like Jesus, but, uh, uh, you yeah, know, obviously the, the highest level of the court would be God himself. Uh, so if, if it comes down from the higher courts that it's all right for them to portray themselves this way, I don't know that it makes sense that this is actually vain. there's a purpose to it all. Uh, uh, as for the meaning of the contradiction of justice and victory, uh, at least in the, the mere concepts, in the truth, ideally, justice should be synonymous with victory. Uh, it's only in human courts that this isn't the case. In a second level, concerning the just, the justness of the trial, because the trial is already always a moving development, the determination of just, of what is just, and what it would mean to have victory of justice in the trial is going to move along with the development of the trial itself. Uh, as new situations arise to try the defendant, the criteria of judgment has to change along with it. Oh, I guess I appear on DC. Uh, yeah, uh, he had to go to bed. Uh, okay. Any thoughts on that? I mean, I agree with everything you've been saying. <coughs> Josh, you gotta, you gotta give me a trial someday. I've got to give you a try. You gotta, gotta make me prove that my, my words are true. I mean, it's not me who has to judge you. You gotta give yourself that trial. But yeah, but part of that is you saying, I W, I disagree. You're full of shit. But with the real reason. <laughs> yeah, no, I think this is all about bureaucracy, actually. I think you're totally wrong. This is just like how, uh, you know, real judges act, real lawyers, uh, real courts. Such a cutting critique. So the side of the picture seemed to make him feel like working. He rolled up his shirt sleeves, picked up a few of the crayons, and Kay watched as a reddish shadow built around the head of the judge under their quivering tips and raided out to the edges of the picture. The shadow play sl slowly surrounded the head like a decoration or lofty distinction. But around the figure of justice, apart from some coloration that was barely noticeable, it remained light. 
and in this brightness the figure seemed to shine forward so that it now looked like neither the god of justice nor the god of victory. It seemed now rather to be a perfect depiction of the god of the hunt. Ooh. Kay found the painter's work more engrossing than he had wanted, but finally he reproached himself for staying so long without having done anything relevant to his own affair. What's the name of this judge? he asked suddenly. I'm not allowed to tell you that, the painter answered. He was bent deeply over the picture and clearly neglected his guest, who, at first, he had received with such care. Kay took this to be just a foible of the painter's and it irritated him as it made him lose time. I take it you must be a trustee of the court, he said. The painter immediately put his crimes down, stood upright, rubbed his hands together, and looked at Kay with a smile. Always straight out with the truth, he said. You want to learn something about the court, like it says in your letter of recommendation, but then you start talking about my pictures to get me on your side. Still, I won't hold it against you. You weren't to know that that was entirely the wrong thing to try with me. Oh, please, he said sharply, repelling Kay's attempt to make some objection. He then continued, and besides, you're quite right in your comment that I'm the trustee of the court. He made a pause as if wanting to give Kay the time to come to terms with this fact. The girls could once more be heard from beside, behind the door. They were probably pressed around the keyhole. Perhaps they could even see into the room through the gaps in the planks. Kay forwent the opportunity to excuse himself in some way as he did not wish to distract the painter from what he was saying. Or else perhaps he didn't want him to get too far above himself and in this way make himself to some extent unattainable, so he asked. Is that a publicly acknowledged position? No, was the painter's curt reply, as if the question prevented him saying any more. How long is this? Okay, not that long. Uh, uh, we'll just read through this and get to the break and then we'll leave it there. So, no, it was the painter's curt reply, as if the question prevent, what prevented him saying any more. But Kay wanted to continue speaking and said, Well, positions like that aren't officially acknowledged, can often have more influence than those that are. And that's how it is with me, said the painter, and nodded with a frown. I was talking about your case with the manufacturer, Pay, the manufacturer yesterday, and he asked me if I would like to help you, and I answered, He can come and see me if he likes, and now I'm pleased to see you here so soon. This business seems to be quite important to you, and of course, I'm not surprised at that. Would you not like to take your coat off? Your coat off now? Kay had intended to stay for only a very short time, but the painter's invitation was nonetheless very welcome. The air in the room had slowly become quite oppressive for him. He had several times looked in amazement at a small iron stove in the corner that certainly could not have been lit. The heat of the room was inexplicable. As he took off his winter overcoat and also unbuttoned his frock coat, the painter said to him an apology, I must have warmth, and it's very cozy here, isn't it? This room's very good in that respect. Kay made no reply, and it was actually not the heat that made him uncomfortable, but much more the stuffiness. The air had almost made it more difficult to breathe. The room had probably not been ventilated for a long time. The unpleasantness of this was made all the stronger for Kay when the painter invited him to sit on the bed while he himself sat down on the only chair in the room in front of the easel. The painter even seemed to misunderstand why Kay remained at the edge of the bed, and urged Kay to make himself comfortable, and as he hesitated, he went over to the bed himself and pressed Kay de deep down into the bedclothes and pillows. Then he went back to his seat, and at last he asked his first objective question, which made Kay forget everything. You're innocent, are you? he asked. Yes, said Kay. He felt a simple joy at answering this question, especially as the answer was given to a private individual and therefore would have no consequences. But why would one think that? Wouldn't an innocent man want to say with conviction that he is innocent in public so that anyone else can know, so that everyone else can judge? Up till then, no one had asked him this question so openly. To make the most of his pleasure, he added, I am totally innocent. So, said the painter, and he lowered his head and seemed to be thinking. Suddenly, he raised his head in, again and said, Well, if you're innocent, it's all very simple. Kay began 
to scowl, the supposed trustee of the court was talking like an ignorant child. My being innocent does not make things simple, said Kay. Despite everything, he couldn't help smiling and slowly shook his head. There are many fine details in which the court gets lost, but in the end it reaches into some place where originally there was nothing and pulls enormous guilt out of it. Yeah, yeah, sure, said the painter, as if Kay had been disturbing his train of thought for no reason. But you are innocent, aren't you? Well, of course I am, said Kay. That's the main thing, said the painter. There was no kind of argument that could influence him, but although he had made up his mind, it was not clear whether he was talking this way because of conviction, conviction or indifference. Kay then wanted to find out and said, therefore, I'm sure you're more familiar with the court than I am. I know hardly more about it than I've heard. Than what I've heard. And that's been from many very different people. But they were all agreed on one thing, and that was that when ill-thought-out accusations are made, they are not ignored, and that once the court has made an accusation, it is convinced of the guilt of the defendant, and it's very hard to make it think otherwise. Very hard? The painter asked, throwing one hand up in the air. It's impossible to make it think otherwise. If I painted all the judges next to each other here on canvas, and you were trying to defend yourself in front of it, you'd have more success with them than you'd ever have with the real court. Yes, said Kay to himself, forgetting that he had only gone there to investigate the painting. All right, let me just read this short other paragraph. One of the girls behind the door started up again and asked, Tiverelli, is he going to go soon? Quiet, shouted the painter at the door. Can't you see I'm talking with the gentleman? But this was not enough to satisfy the girl and she asked, you going to paint his picture? And when the painter didn't answer, she added, Please don't paint him. He's an horrible bloke. There followed an incomprehensible interwoven babble of shouts and replies and calls of agreement. The painter leapt over the door, opened it very slightly. The girls clasped hands, could be seen stretching out to the cracks as if they wanted something, and said, If you're not quiet, I'll throw you all down the stairs. Sit down here on the steps and be quiet. They probably did not obey him immediately, so he had command, Down on the steps! Only then it became quiet. Alright, we'll leave it there. One last comment on that is... Okay, part of the significance of children is that children have no fucking filter. Uh, they tell it as they see it. Uh, whereas everyone else... is very nice and lies to Kay about how nice he is. Uh, that's that struck me for the first time here. No one else lets him know that he's a fucking asshole. Uh, but these little kids have. Uh, now the interesting thing is that they haven't really interacted with him, but they can tell that he's an asshole. Uh, now I there is an, another translation in which they don't say he's a horrible person or horrible bro bloke um, another translation I've uh, read says he's ugly which makes more sense to me uh, I, I suppose I'd have to go check what the German says uh, it would make a lot more sense given the theme of this chapter that they would say he's ugly and uh, this would obviously be telling about what kind of person K is. Uh, it would be an external expression that they see him for what he internally is, whereas you know in the normal world people see him only superficially, uh, and that would provide a very nice inverted contrast to what the painter is doing with the judges. Uh, that uh, what K and the painter say about the judges is actually the way other people treat K in that they take the surface appearance to be the reality and uh, they ignore the internal reality of like what he's really like. Uh, it's just a very interesting contrast. So yeah, we'll leave it here. Page 81. For those of you listening, hope you find that interesting. Uh, there wasn't much to say in this chapter, or at least this part of this chapter. Uh, not a lot of symbolic stuff, uh, 
or insofar as it was symbolic, it was a pretty straightforward symbolism. We'll finish this chapter next time. See you around.